This video is brought to you by Privacy.com. Go to Privacy.com or use the link in the description to get $5 for your first Privacy.com purchase today. Hey Wisecrack, Michael again. If you've ever been inside a college dorm, you've likely seen a lot of Fight Club posters displayed over janky twin beds. If you, like me, tend to overthink everything, you might ask, what does this declaration of love for the 1999 classic mean for this hypothetical freshman? Maybe it's just a token of recognition that David Fincher knows how to make a damn good movie, or that Brad Pitt is crazy good looking. Maybe it indicates solidarity with frustrated men who feel disenfranchised and desire to reassert their masculinity. Or maybe it's the exact opposite, a reminder that such forms of masculinity can be horrifying. Or maybe it's just that consumerism is bad. Until you ask said poster owner, they remain Schrodinger's fan. You never really know until you investigate further. And it's not just Fight Club. Plenty of works of art elicit radically different and often mutually exclusive interpretations. 1984, Starship Troopers, American Psycho, and even the Bible have been interpreted in a variety of ways. Sometimes it seems like the interpreters must have read dramatically different works. What's going on here? How can the same text have so many, often contradictory messages? Is there one true reading? Or conversely, if every interpretation is valid, does that make the text meaningless? Where everything could be made to mean literally anything? If not, how do we distinguish between the good readings and the bad? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on interpretations and spoilers ahead for Fight Club and uh, the Bible? But before the brainy stuff, I wanna give a shout out to privacy.com. Privacy.com is a free tool you can use to keep your credit card information protected from snoops, bots, and your weird cousin Gary. With privacy, you can create virtual cards that are locked to a merchant so you can choose exactly where you spend your money, even if you wanna blow it all on eBay buying vintage Lego sets. No judgment. I really love that you can add limits to the card so you can only spend a certain amount once, per month or per year. This makes it so easy to protect myself from accidentally getting billed twice or online shopping in my sleep. If a hacker gets a hold of your card information, they can't use it anywhere else, and you can delete it faster than you can say identity theft. Plus, with Privacy.com's Chrome browser extension, you can create a new card with the click of a button. It's stupid easy to protect your info. So head to Privacy.com slash Wisecrack and sign up for an account. New customers will get $5 to spend on your first Privacy.com purchase for a limited time only. Once again, that's Privacy.com slash Wisecrack. Now back to the show. First, what do we mean when we say reading? When you read a text, you're not just looking at the plot, but also the subtext and themes. For example, Jaws' plot is about a seaside town rocked by shark attacks, but the subtext could be about the dark side of small town America, the eternal fight between man and nature, or if you're Fidel Castro, it's about capitalist exploitation. Because a subtext isn't explicit, it can be open to interpretation and thus spawn hundreds of video essays. Thanks, subtext. Take Fight Club, which has been written about and interpreted to death. If you don't know, it's the story of a repressed man who starts a revolution after turning a basement into a sparring room with his imaginary friend. In the movie, Tyler Durden, the charismatic driving force behind the titular Fight Club, turns his decrepit house into a boot camp for homegrown terrorists. His action wouldn't be out of place in a re-education camp. He strips a group of men of their individuality so that they will do what their self-appointed dictator tells them to do. You are not special. You are not but earlier in the film, Durden points out that modern society does the same thing, asking us to craft identities around consumer products and the jobs we need to afford them. You are not your job. You're not how much money you have in the bank. You're not the car you drive. You're not the contents of your wallet. You're not your khakis. Which brings us back to the poster problem. Does it worship Durden as a subversive hero who emancipates men from an oppressive society? Or does it warn us of how supposed liberation might oppress us even more? As you can see, a text meaning can vary depending on who's watching, to the point of contradiction. But is that a bad thing? Art is subjective, after all. In the real world, the impact from different interpretations can, well, change history. Perhaps no text has been reinterpreted more than the Bible and we're not going to touch the conflicting interpretations of the various sects of the major religions that use the Old or New Testaments. We're not saying anyone is wrong. Well, except one guy. Let me introduce you to Joel Osteen, an American pastor and televangelist worth an estimated $50 million. Joel preaches the Prosperity Gospel, a collection of ideas that join Christian faith with financial success. Essentially, money is good because God said so. 
Osteen uses quotes from the Bible like Hebrews 10.35, which says, do not cast away your confidence for it will be richly rewarded as proof that God wants you to make bank. Conveniently, this means that his $10.5 million mansion in Texas is God's will. While it's clearly all about the Benjamins for Osteen and his megachurch, his interpretation of the Bible has its fair share of critics, particularly from, well, uh, Jesus. Remember the cleansing of the temple? And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Now, call me a literalist here, but there doesn't seem to be much wiggle room there. So if the same text can mean two contradictory things, does that simply mean that anything can mean whatever you want it to mean? The author of Fight Club himself, Chuck Palahniuk, perhaps thinks so. In an interview about his new book, Adjustment Day, he said, people project their own meaning on text, something he seems to relish. What all of this speaks to is a question of literary theory. Differing schools of thought have proposed various ways of approaching a text. Perception theory, formalism, structuralism, psychoanalysis, and post-structuralism to name a few. But today we're going to focus on a particular mode of thought, semiotics. Semiotics is the study of signs and symbols. In the modern sense, the term was coined by philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce. By signs, we don't just mean that this means stop. Rather, semiotics is the study of the process that goes into knowing what someone is referring to when they communicate something through language. A linguist named Ferdinand de Saussure gave this process his own spin and broke it down into two things, the signifier and the signified. The signifier is the symbol, usually a word or phrase, that points to the thing that is signified. So the letters D-O-G, arranged thus, are signifiers for that group of perfect four-legged fluffers. Or the phrase, save Martha, is a signifier for very bad writing, or something about rescuing Superman's mom. As the last example illustrates, meaning can get complicated real quick. For Saussure, the relationship between signifiers and their meaning is the product of not just some capital R reality, but a whole system of other signifiers. In a simple case, the word or signifier dog has a meaning, but that meaning is more than just dogness. It also means not cats, who also have four legs and can be fluffy. We can understand more about what a dog is like by understanding this juxtaposition to something like a cat. Cats meow, dogs bark, and so on. In this way, the signifiers and signified only attain their meaning in relation to other signifiers. So when I make a joke about Save Martha, that phrase and its meaning would be informed by other signifiers, like the DCEU, Superman's relationship to his mother, and bad writing. If it sounds complicated, that's kind of the point, because so is language. Philosopher Jacques Derrida was inspired by Saussure, but had some problems with his work. Because in Saussure's model, in spite of the complicated way meaning was constructed, it was still conveyed pretty seamlessly. I write dog, you say the word dog in your head, and conjure an image. Part of the trouble is that signifiers can often mean different things to different people. Like if I say Woody, you might think of the character in Toy Story, or the guy who made Annie Hall, or Clive Owen's acting style. The word signifies a lot of different things, and my intent could get lost. But if I say, Jared's dog, Woody. More of you might know what I'm talking about. You still might not know what he looks like though. Your idea of dog could be a pug, a German shepherd, or a chihuahua. But if I say Jared's Maltese poodle mix, Woody, you're gonna have a much better, but maybe imperfect idea of how much of a baller he is. This tenuous relationship between what is said and what it's referring to without getting lost ad infinitum and modifiers and clarifications is where the gap for interpretation opens up and where we get these totally different understandings of the same text. And here's where we return to, can anything mean anything? According to Derrida, no. Despite the need for interpretation and in what we say and what is understood, that does not dissolve any kind of meaning into a choose your own adventure. Derrida was more like Peirce. Peirce was a pragmatist. Unlike other philosophers who sought absolute and eternal capital T truth, Pragmatists thought of the search for truth as a kind of iterative, fix-it-as-you-go process. The same could be said for meaning, and Derrida embraced this unending process. Therefore, meaning isn't given, but always requires careful interpretation and attention to the things that surround a particular sign in order to make it meaningful. So instead of absolving us of the responsibility to look at the context of signs when creating their meaning, the malleability of language should make us more responsible. So when I say Woody, 
By now, most of you should know that I'm talking about Jared's dog. I just mentioned him and Jared talks about him a lot in our videos, so I don't need to explain who or what he is because there isn't really much room for interpretation. This context creates a kind of ecosystem of ideas so that all the interrelated signifiers and what they signify add up to this handsome pup. This map for understanding is like a geographical map in that even though it changes incrementally over time and there might be zoning disputes, you still need one to get to the right destination. So let's get back to Fight Club and look at the roadmap for interpreting what that text and the poster on the wall might mean. What goes on the map? Well, obviously there's the characters and their ideologies, primarily the narrator and Tyler Durden. Also the actual things that happen in the plot. The narrator likes his nice life with nice things and Tyler Durden doesn't. Noting that things you own end up owning you. Then there's the story structure. Like many antagonists, Durden's role is to put forth the radical ideas that disrupt the protagonist's way of thinking. This creates a central conflict that the protagonist has to reconcile by finding a happy medium between the villain's philosophy and the status quo. So in this case, we could say that Tyler Durden's critique of our consumer society is either true or mostly true. Now why do guys like you and I know what a today is? Is this essential to our survival? In the hunter-gatherer sense of the word? No. What are we then? Consumers. But his solutions go too far. Case in point, Durden complains that men are emasculated in society. We're a generation of men raised by women. I'm wondering if another woman is really the answer we need. Then literally threatens to emasculate them. Seems like a problem. You're gonna publicly state that there is no underground group. Or these guys are gonna take your balls. Over at the edges of the map might be the book which the movie can deliberately diverge from, but can still add additional context. In the last chapter, the narrator takes Durden's snowflake comment and rejects both the status quo and Durden's dehumanization of his followers, saying that we are not special, we are not crap or trash either, we just are. Another point on this map might be what Chuck Palahniuk has actually said about it. In one interview, Palahniuk claims that the term snowflake came from Fight Club and that there's a new Victorian sense of offense in the world. In a later interview, he backtracked and said Snowflake never had anything to do with fragility or sensitivity. He also claims the book has a lot to do with his own rejection of the self-importance that was drilled into him by teachers. Maybe more central on this map, if we're talking about the film, is the filmmaker himself, David Fincher. He said, we were making a satire. This is as serious about blowing up buildings as The Graduate is about mom's friend. And you, like a good Derridian, might ask what we've left out of this map that might also help us interpret the film and or book. Looking at the map thus far, we can admire Pitt's performance or the character's writing, and he may even have some astute points on sociology. But in the context of the movie, or in relation to the signs and signifiers around Durden, he's definitely not a role model. And of course, we can update this map and hone this map, but there's not many versions of this map that shout, go be like Tyler Durden. Now let's turn to our buddy Joel and the good book. Like we said earlier, the cleansing of the temple has become a pretty well-known lesson from the Bible that explicitly states using a church or temple to extract personal wealth ain't cool with J-Dog or God. While Osteen might argue otherwise, the fact that he and his fellow prosperity pastors have reinterpreted the Bible to mean the exact opposite shows a lack of semiotic responsibility on their part. If we look at George Orwell's endlessly reinterpreted text 1984, it has been referenced by everyone wanting to make any point about powerful actors. Of course, leveraging the themes of 1984 to argue about some new context is fine and well, but it's oftentimes leveraged in ways that seem flat out wrong or besides the point to Orwell's original message. Firmament, vaulted dome of the earth, George Orwell, 1984, must read. It's sadly become a phrase that just signifies a big bad thing that is allegedly trying to control you. In psychology, there's this idea called concept creep which talks about how definitions of abuse or bullying have been stretched to accommodate things they were not originally intended for. Others have used it to describe how other general terms will slowly stretch their original meaning, which is how we are using it. Now, words often naturally change in the scope of their meaning over time, like how decimate went from just meaning to kill every 10th man to just destroying a bunch of stuff. But when you're trying to use the original meaning of a thing, concept creep gets tricky. Like what if I really did want to specifically describe killing every 10th person? Now you're just going to think I meant a bunch of people and my intended meaning is lost. 
In the case of 1984, the result is that a book often voted one of the greatest of all time has been divorced from what it was originally meant to signify, and now means a lot less than it should, despite its dire warnings of mass surveillance, the collapse of public and private identity, historical revisionism, and propaganda. What a text means, whether it's 1984, Fight Club, or the Bible, is not set in stone and can be read in a lot of different ways. But that's what makes it so important for us to be responsible readers. Saying anything can mean whatever you want it to has dangerous results, as anyone who has driven past a road close sign will tell you. If we recklessly manipulate cultural objects like books and films to suit our narratives, we undermine their value. Every text exists in relation to many other ideas, and semiotics is a way that we can decode meaning by looking at the kind of creative ecosystem a text inhabits. Because of that, the emphasis shouldn't only be on the authors of the work to deliver a text meaning, but on us as responsible readers and viewers to understand the relationship between the signifier we are presented with and what that signifies, which is why there will only ever be one Woody. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And before you go, thanks again to privacy.com for sponsoring this video. Head to privacy.com slash wisecrack and sign up for an account. New customers will get $5 to spend on your first privacy.com purchase for a limited time only. Once again, that's privacy.com slash wisecrack. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.